A preacher was driving along a country road, and his car broke down. And so he began to walk, and he found a roadhouse, kind of a, a seedy joint, a dark place, a bunch of people at the bar looking miserable. He walked in, got on the phone, called CAA, and then he looked over and he saw a guy he knew, a former parishioner of his named Frank. He said, Frank, I haven't seen you in forever. Now Frank was, was kind of disheveled, he was a little bit dirty, his clothes looked tattered, and he just looked so upset. He said, what, what, what's happened, Frank? So he used to be a very successful, put-together guy. And Frank began to unload on the poor pastor, saying about all of these things that had happened to him and the calamities in his life, primarily that he'd had some bad business deals, he'd lost all his money, and he was now destitute. And the preacher said, you know what? Here's what you do, Frank. You go home, take a shower, put on some clean clothes, and open your Bible. I want you to flip through the Bible and just point into that Bible. And whatever it says where your finger lands is God's word to you. And so that's what he did. Well, the preacher knows nothing about what happened. Sometime later, he bumps into Frank again. This time, Frank's getting out of a Mercedes Benz. He's got a Rolex on his wrist. He's dressed in a Gucci suit. He's looking good. And he says, Frank, my goodness, you look so much better. What happened? Frank says, well, preacher, I did exactly what you said. I went home, cleaned myself up, opened up the Bible, flipped through, put my finger there, and there was God's word to me, God's answer to all of my problems. Well, what was that word? The preacher said, and Frank said, chapter 11. <laughs> Bankruptcy, if you don't know. You know, when we talk about hearing God's will for our lives, connecting with his signal more clearly, the probably number one thing we think about is this, right? The Bible. I mean, if you want to hear God's will, you want to know what he wants for your life, this is primarily where you go. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And I have to say, this is pretty low-hanging fruit for me because I love the Bible. I don't even have to write a sermon. I could just get up and talk for hours about it. But I did, so I could keep it to half an hour. <laughs> I promise you, I have a PowerPoint presentation and I'll stick to it. But that being said, before we launch into how God speaks clearly through his word, let's acknowledge that there's other ways that he speaks to us. We talked about a whole bunch of them last week, right? Uh, very inspiring to hear the stories of how God is active in people's lives in different ways. And we're going to continue to talk about different ways next week and in future weeks. Um, but today, let's talk about how God speaks to us through prayer. Because it's a pretty significant way that God speaks to us. The question, I think, <clears throat> for most of us is, how? How does God speak through prayer? I mean, we all have the same Bible, more or less. There's different translations, but they all say pretty much the same thing. But we don't always agree on what it says, right? Right now, our, our very denomination is going through a, a deep and, and difficult study on, on the role of full inclusion in LGBTQI plus people in our church. And we have people with opposite opinions both reading the same Bible, interpreting it differently. And after two decades of conversation about this, we can't seem to agree on what it says. And these are elders and pastors having these conversations. So what hope do the rest of us have, right, in trying to understand what the Bible says? Well, today I'm gonna to talk about five different approaches we can take to the scriptures, and I can't definitively answer all of your questions, but maybe I can point you in the right direction. So, the first way that we can kind of go about reading the scripture is the flip and point method. 
or just a random method. I know that most of you have been told by your pastor over the years that you should read the Bible. So I don't know if you've done this because I know I have. I haven't read it in a while. So I'm kind of feeling guilty about it, right? So I go and search and find my Bible. And I find it. And what, do I, what do I do? I just, just kind of open it up and start reading, right? Which is good. Which is good. You're reading the Bible, and that's good. Maybe not the best method, though. I mean, this method is good in that you're saying, okay, God, lead the way. And maybe God will speak to you like that. Uh, maybe he won't. When I was in Bible college, <coughs> I, I was smitten with this girl named Sarah. Sarah was maybe not the kindest person, nor, if I'm honest, the most intelligent, but she had other assets. She was really, really hot. Just a beautiful girl. And, and I struggled, should I ask Sarah out? And I thought I might have a shot, so I went to the Bible and I just kind of flipped it open and I read what it said. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. So there, I had my answer from God, right? Through the Holy Spirit, do not date Sarah. Well, then the question was, well, who should I date? And I flipped through my Bible again, and this time I landed on Isaiah. You shall go out with joy. So I did. I had an uncle who was a, a very devout Christian and also a very devout smoker, and, and he just captured by this addiction. And I went to him one day and I said, listen, how, how do you reconcile Christianity and, and, and smoking? It just doesn't seem to, to correlate very well. And he said, well, actually I read it in the Bible. The Bible told me I should start smoking. <clears throat> I said, well, that, that doesn't sound right, but you know, I'm willing to listen. He said, well, okay, first of all, First Corinthians, it says, do you not know that your body is a temple? Right, we know that. And then, of course, in Revelation 15, the temple was filled with smoke. <laughs> okay, none of those things happened. You know, those are made up stories. You know, perhaps God uses this method, the, the, the flip and point method. In this Bible, it always leans to Psalms, because that's kind of the middle of the book. But uh, I don't know if that's the best way. Because there's some potential, isn't there, for a little bit of abuse of the scriptures, just kind of taking its meaning for what you want it to be. The second way is eisegetically. Now, I know you know this word, you use it every day. Eisegetically, it, it comes from the Greek word ice, which means into, and uh, hegestai, hegestai, to lead. And so the idea here is when you read the Bible eisegetically, you're reading into scripture, right? So you take that sermon you heard 20 years ago, that podcast you listened to, your pastor's sermon on Sunday, your parents' teachings, and you go flipping through the Bible, and you come to a passage, and you say, oh, I know what that means. Right? And you read your interpretation into the scriptures. And there's some challenges with this. So I read this week that in about 512 BC, Darius I of Persia led his armies north of the Black Sea. And, and the Scythians on the other side sent him a message as his armies approached. And that message was a mouse, a frog, a bird, and five arrows. While well, Darius summoned his captains and he said, my captains, our victory is assured. Our enemies have sent us this message and this is what it means. These arrows signify that the Scythians will lay down their arms. The mouse means that the land of the Scythians will be surrendered to us. The frog means that the rivers and lakes will all be ours. <coughs> and 
and the Scythian army will flee before us like a bird from our forces. Well, the advisors to Darius heard this, and they thought about it for a little bit, and they said, hmm, maybe, maybe not. Maybe the Scythians mean that by these things, unless you turn into birds and fly away, or into frogs and hide in the waters, or into mice and burrow into the ground, you will all be slain by the Scythian archers. And Darius took this counsel. He decided that the second interpretation was correct, and he beat a hasty retreat. Well, you know, we can do the same thing with our Bibles, right? We can read into it what we want to hear. Some, sometimes this is just unavoidable. I mean, we're human beings. There's no such thing as an unbiased perspective. There isn't. But we can be aware of our biases. I've learned over the years that sometimes when I read this thing, like really read it, my theology doesn't stand up. It is true. Even, even now, after courses and courses and seminary, theological training, sometimes when I read the scriptures I go, now, that's not what I believe. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's so easy to read into scripture the things that we'd like to read. For example, let's check out Philippians 4. You know Philippians 4, right? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I'm sure that many of you, when you were 21, had this taped to your bathroom mirror, right? Or highlighted in your Bible. When you were struggling, you held on to this passage. Like, I can get through this breakup. Or I can get that job. I can run that marathon. Whatever it is, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I like this verse. This would make a great bumper sticker. Am I right? Okay, well, do me a favor. Pull out your Bibles. They're in the pews. I, I, I went around this morning and I put them in for you. I provided them so you'd, you'd have one. Uh, Philippians. <coughs> so, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, a little bit further, Colossians, Thessalonians. Boy, the pages are sticky, aren't they? Did I go by it? I did go by 18, there it is, Philippians, bye. Page 1826, if you have this version, some of them are larger print, might be slightly different. Okay, so we're in Philippians, we've we found chapter four, which is a page over, and now we're finding verse 13. Okay, I found it, but here's what I'd like to do. I'm gonna read, and read along with me, verses 10 to 14, okay? Verses 10 to 14, so I'm on 1830. <coughs> Philippians 4, verse 10. This is Paul speaking to the Philippians. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. I'm really happy, in other words, that you've thought of me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And now we come to that verse, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. So when we look at this, we see some things are going on, right? I don't know if you know this, but Paul is writing this letter from prison. 
He's writing from prison. He's not in a great place. And he says, I've gone through joy, I've gone through sorrow, and after looking at all of this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do joy, I can do the good times, and I can do sorrow, and I can do the bad times through him. That's the all things, right? The good and the bad, right? Which is kind of funny because what did God say to Adam, right? You'll know good and evil. So here we go. Read in context, we are doing something different than eisegesis. We are doing exegesis. We are reading the Bible exegetically. You see, the Greek word ex means out. So here, we're letting the meaning lead itself out of the text. Instead of reading into it, we're reading out of it and letting God speak to our lives out of the text. Where exegesis read into scripture, eisegesis read into scripture, exegesis reads out of scripture. The question is, how do we do this, right? I mean, how do we read the text exegetically? Well, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is be a detective. What do detectives do primarily? They ask questions. They ask questions and they follow the evidence. So the first question you want to ask of any text is who wrote it? The second question you want to ask is who received it? If you read any commentary, you're going to find that they spend pages and pages laboring over these answers. And you're going to think, why is it even important? Well, let me ask you this. If you're walking along and you find a note on the ground, you don't know who wrote it, and it says on the note just simply this, when I find you, I'm going to kill you. What do you do with that note? Do you take it to the police? This is a threat, right? Or it could mean something else. The first part of the note could be, I can't believe you surprised me with a surprise birthday party. When I find you, I'm going to kill you. It could be an expression of affection and appreciation. Knowing who wrote it and to whom they wrote is extremely important to setting the context. Without that, it can be very difficult. Now the next question you want to answer is where? Where was it written? But not just Paul was writing from prison and from Rome, but Paul was writing from prison in Rome. So where was it written? And where were the people, right, to whom it was written? And what was going on? What's the situation that's happening? Um, books of Revelation, we did Revelation a number of months back, and when we started to put that book into context, we saw that it actually wasn't quite as crazy and out there as we thought, right? As it was written to real, actual people, meeting real, actual needs. The next question is why? Do you write a letter for no reason? Especially when you have to go and purchase expensive parchment and, and get expensive ink or whatever they used back then, right? Like, it was a big deal to write a letter. You had to have a good reason. You couldn't whip out your phone and just send a quick text, right? How's your day today? You couldn't do that. So why were they writing? And really, what are they saying? What is the message? After you've done those things, you can finally do what most of us do within the first three seconds of reading the Bible. How does it apply to me? Once you've done those steps, then you can make that leap from 2,000 years ago to today. So let's try this out. You've got Philippians 4 in front of you. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So let's talk about it. The Apostle Paul is under house arrest and he's awaiting trial where he might possibly be put to death for preaching the resurrection of Jesus. Now he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
He's not talking about being embarrassed about his friends finding out he was a Christian. <laughs> He's talking about literally being on trial for his life. However, instead of being defeated by his unfortunate circumstances, Paul is using this opportunity because obviously they've written him, right? He says, I'm happy you've shown me concern. They've obviously reached out to him and said, hey, what do you need? What can we do for you? And he's using this opportunity to say, it's okay. Don't worry about me. I can endure any circumstance because I've been through the good, I've been through the bad, and I know that in every instance, he has given me strength to endure it. The ups, the downs, the highs, the lows. I have a strength, Paul says, that only comes from Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I relate to this a little bit more now that I know what's going on and what he's experiencing. When he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, I know that it's a real substantive message that he's lived out. And this supernatural strength to endure all seasons and all situations is always with Paul because the Holy Spirit of Christ is always with him, even in prison. God has not abandoned me, he says. God, God is right here, right here with me. He is, no, he is no further than my own heart, right? So we've kind of answered these questions. Who? Well, it's uh, Paul. And who? He's writing to the Philippians. And, and if, we were pre- if I was preaching this text, I'd explain what they were going through. Where is he writing? Well, he's writing from prison in Rome, house arrest in 62 AD. Why is he writing? He's wanting to encourage the Philippians who are also going through hard times. They're also experiencing their own difficulties. And I think this is why he's writing. So the what question, what's his message? The message is that he can endure any circumstance, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, because he has a strength that only comes through Christ and the spirit of Christ. And then the how. How do we apply this to our lives? Well, in many ways, but I think I would initially say, because the spirit of Christ is also with us, we too can endure even the most difficult circumstances through the Christ who gives us strength. That's what I would do with it. Let's look at one more. You know this one? It's picking out a couple really famous verses. For where two or three are gathered in my name or gathered together, there am I among them. And I'm sure that you've often heard this verse especially if your dad didn't want to go to church that day. Right? Well, you know, kids, let's just have a little prayer time with the football game on in the background. You know, for where two or three are gathered together, there am I among them. <clears throat> if you've got a Bible, check out Matthew chapter 18. What's going on here? Matthew's easy to find. It's the first book of the New Testament. 1527. Any of you go to Sunday school and do Bible drills? Right? Matthew 1527. All right, Matthew 15, or Matthew 18, verse 20. So there we read, for where two or three come together in my name. There I am with them. Now, back up to verse 15. Back up to verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen, even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, 
there am I with them. Okay, I, I, I think that verse 19 is a pretty famous one too, isn't it? So let's do some detective work here. What's going on? Well, this verse is often used to uh, support not going to church on Sunday. Or if you have a low attendance at your worship service, say it's okay. The Lord's with us. And I think that is in fact true. And, but in context, this verse is all about what? Well, it's all about church problems. If your brother offends you, if your brother does something against you, you go and you speak to him. And if that doesn't work, you get a couple more. If that doesn't work, you go to the church. And the goal is restoration. And then at the end, now we find that Jesus is talking, I think, to those who are in leadership, who finally have to say, now what do we do with this person who just won't see what they've done, will not seek reconciliation. So what we have is an encouragement to church leaders during tough times of loving con confrontation to say that God will be with them. God will be with them in this difficult time. There were two or three witnesses are together, and if they agree that this fella is just not coming around to wanting to be in fellowship and to restore things, then God is still with them. So when we read this, who's speaking? Well, that one's pretty easy. Jesus. Who is he talking to? Disciples. Where is he? If you read a little bit earlier, Capernaum. Why? What's the issue? Forgiveness and restoration of a brother. Now, the Bible was written from a male-dominated perspective, so can we agree we can include sisters in that, right? And what? What's the message? I think we have an encouragement to church leaders during tough times of loving confrontation to say that God will be present with them. He will give them wisdom and he will give them comfort. And I think also the implication is that God is working through his spirit to bring restoration. Because ultimately our God is the God of restoration. And the how. How do we apply this today? Well, let's say that forgiveness and restoration are worth the short term discomfort of confronting a brother or sister in Christ who's gone astray. Just as Jesus leaves the 99 sheep to find the lost sheep, we are called with the blessing of God's presence to do the same. I, I think, in a way, this is evangelistic, which is weird, right? What we've kind of done with this verse. So, We've done some good work moving away from eisegesis into exegesis. A lot of you are probably thinking, how do I do this? How do I answer these questions, right? I didn't go to Bible college. I didn't go to seminary. Well, you know what? The good news is that a lot of the answers are right in here, just with a close reading of the text. Read before, read after. I would encourage you to not flip and point, but to start with a book or a letter and just work your way through. Because then you start to get, you know who's writing, you know who they're writing to, you start to understand their challenges, you start to understand the viewpoint of the writer and the theological points that they're bringing up, right? And then when you have a question that fails you, there are so many resources out there. So let's say you want to study this is John. This is a great book, John for Everyone by Tom Wright. You want to study John. Go on Amazon, $15, buy a commentary. Questions, a lot of them can be answered through here. Um, there are encyclopedias, biblical dictionaries. The internet is a terrible resource. Any, any dummy with a keyboard can write anything on the internet, including me. So, trust me, the internet is not a great place to go to for your biblical knowledge. Podcasts are fantastic. 
Go on your phone, download CastBox, and, and you, just about every amazing theologian, biblical author has some kind of podcast. They just do. And you can drive along and listen to these. I, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I get lonely in the shower. <laughs> do you get lonely in the shower? Listen, that's not an invitation, okay? <laughs> Keep your pants on. I'm just saying, I get lonely in the shower. And I, you know, I have ADD, so I, this morning I listened to 45 minutes of Richard Rohr in, in the bathroom getting ready. Right? It was amazing. Such theological depth there while otherwise doing nothing. Yeah. So... There you go. We've got to move on to the next one. Our time is running out. <laughs> I don't want to rush the end worship because I think the ending worship is going to be really great. The fourth way we can read the Bible is prayerfully. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in studying the Word of God, which is good. I just spent 10 minutes talking about how it's good. That sometimes it becomes a textbook, Right? This is especially true of pastors whose job it is to literally get paid to study the Bible. So one of the ways we can combat this is to approach the Bible prayerfully. Gypsy Smith told of a man who said that he had no inspiration, he had received no inspiration from the Bible, although and according to him, in quote, he had gone through it many times. No inspiration from the Bible, even though he had gone through it many times. And Smith's reply, let it go through you once, and you will tell a different story. One way to read the Bible is prayerfully. To not, to not get so caught up in the details, but let God speak to you through it. Now, the question is, how do you do it? Let me give you one way. This is just one way. <clears throat> and I can teach you more about this if you want. I can even do a Saturday morning teaching on this. Lectio Divina. Lectio means reading. Divina means divine, right? So, divine reading. Lectio Divina kind of comes out of the, the, the Jewish tradition of the Haggadah. Do you know what that is? At Passover, they would read the Passover story, right, from Exodus. And every year, they would read that story. Much like we read the Christmas story and the Easter story. This, this retelling of the story became, it's central to who they are as a people. And, and so, uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, around 330 AD, and, and about 100 years later, this guy named St. Benedict, for the Benedictine order. These guys sort of developed this idea of the Haggadah in a Christian sense, divine reading. And here's what you do. It's, it's really simple. The first thing you do is find a quiet place. You need a quiet place. This is hard for me in my house these days with a three and a half year old. <laughs> so this is something I have to go off site to do, which means I haven't done a lot of like to a divina lately. <clears throat> Find a quiet place, find a comfortable spot, sit in a chair, center yourself. It can be helpful to light a candle as a centering tool. This may all sound weird to you, but trust me, it's good stuff. And just kind of breathe. Just breathe in, breathe out, breathe deeply. Um, if breath prayers are part of your discipline, that's why I practice breath, breath prayers. A simple one could be, Lord Jesus, speak to me. Just repeat that in and out until you find yourself calm and centered. And the first thing you do after that is you read a text. How you find that is up to you. Maybe the passage of the Samaritan woman at the well or whatever it is. Take a short text and you read it. You don't read it to study it though. You, you read it with one question on your mind, one prayer. Lord, what word or phrase do you have for me today? So as you read it, 
and, just, and read it out loud. I think it's a good way to do it. Is there a word or phrase that jumps out at you? And you may have to do this more than once. Read it slowly and just, just let the spirits, it could be holy. The word holy jumps out at you. Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The reading, the first time through, you just want that word. The second time you read through it, okay, Lord, what are you saying to me about this word? And I've done like you at Divina Circles back in seminary. It's so cool. And we would just take turns saying, okay, what's the word? We'd all go around and say our word. Then we'd read it again. Well, what's God saying? Amazing how God speaks so clearly sometimes. God is saying to me that I need holiness. He is holy. And I don't need to worry about being holy. Whatever it is. Individual to each context. Now the third thing, after you've read and you've reflected, is respond. Okay, this is the oratio. God, what do you want me to do about it? Right? So what's that word, a selectio? What, do you, what are you saying to me about it? It's a meditatio. The oratio is God, what do you want me to do about this? And you sit and you wait for God to speak. And then finally you rest. Spend five, ten minutes just simply breathing and being and allowing God to speak to you. You know how a couple of weeks ago we said one of the reasons we don't always hear God's voice is because we won't shut up. Lectio Divina takes the word, combines it with prayer, and allows God to speak to us in a powerful way. All right, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> Prayerfully. Finally, relationally. This is simple. The Bible is not... Where did my Bible go? What's under there? <laughs> Couldn't find it. The Bible is not a how-to book, okay? It's not a rule book. It's not even a theology textbook. And I know that because Jesus was always fighting with the Pharisees about this. They tried to turn the Bible into a weapon to control people and beat them down, right? He said that they placed a yoke, a burden on your shoulders, which I'm trying to remove. This Bible is a collection of 66 letters written by around 40 plus authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But it's more than just an anthology. It's, it's a story of God's relationship with his people. And it includes all kinds of different literature. It's got histories and, and parables and poetry and songs. It's got all kinds of good stuff in it. But every single word in here, every single word is here for one purpose. And that is to bring you into a deeper relationship with the Word of God. Capital W. And who is the Word of God with a capital W? It's Jesus himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I love Carrie Ann's song that she picked right before the sermon. It was all about that. I thought, yes. Which means I had no idea what she was going to sing today. This book is designed, its purpose and its intent is to not be a textbook or a rule book or even a theology text. Although we get all that stuff through it, is to lead you into a deeper relationship with the Word of God, Jesus himself. You see, knowing the Word is great, but knowing the Word is so much better. You know, Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so often, especially for Bible college students, we forget that. We think it's the Bible that brings us to God. But it's Christ through the Word of God as it leads us into a relationship with Him that has that, that power 
that Carrie Ann and the team were singing about. So, what is the word saying to you about the word? How is it leading you deeper into the way, the truth, and the life? Yes, God is always broadcasting, but are we getting all five bars? And one of the ways that he's broadcasting is through the Bible. And so I pray that we have, would have ears to hear clearly what God is saying to us as we seek to connect more clearly with the God who speaks. Let's pray.